Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of White Pod. My name is Harshit, and I'm the director of business alliances at White Labs. We are a digital agency specializing in SaaS and e commerce SEO. I've got Sherry with me today. She's the head of marketing at Ovation CXM, a brilliant CX platform that connects partners and AI to customer journeys. A big welcome to you, Sherry. So happy to have you with me. Well, I really appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me. Brent, Shari, let's start with your you know journey in the field of marketing. You know your early days at DECA, and can you share a bit more about you know how your early experiences basically shaped your career path? Yeah, so I actually started dib- dabbling and dipping my toe into marketing probably in high school. We had an organization called Deca. And I was active in DECA for my freshman year all the way through my senior year of high school and then was president of the program for my last, my junior and senior year. And it's at that early stage, you're taking these very specific classes around marketing as part of your daily curriculum. And then we're also competing in both local district to regional to then state and national tournaments in a variety of different marketing activities. And so I always loved it. I loved the creativity. I loved that it was very different, the variety of different things that you had to think about that B2C marketing was very different than B2B marketing, very different from hospitality to retail and you name it. But I actually wanted to go into broadcast journalism. I wanted to be the next Katie Couric and be on TV and interview people. So I actually went to school for broadcast journalism, but I was a marketing minor. Always wanted to kind of keep it in my blood. But I graduated in the financial downturns of the 708 era, and it was really hard to find a job. So I started my career in sales. That was my first job out of college, and I was doing sales for the military but what I actually really got to learn through all of that, it was like what w- what it was like to have really great marketing support and what it was like to need a little bit more marketing support. And I did that. I was in sales for four years, selling boots and body armor and underwater robots to the military. And it was a very male-dominated industry. Got a lot of learning from that as well. Stepping on base and having to learn about and how to sell tools and government contracts to senior chiefs. But I left that after four years when my husband took a career change and a relocation. And that's when I decided, you know what, I'm just going to go back into marketing. And I've been doing marketing ever since. So about 16 years now of marketing work. And I actually think all of those different experiences have really shaped my approach to marketing. Having started my career in sales, I have always found it so important to have that really healthy bridge between sales and marketing, what sales is seeing and hearing in the marketplace, what they need to be able to educate and learn about your products and offerings, what marketing needs to provide to them, but even more importantly, what my marketing needs to listen to, to understand what's going on from the prospects and from the customers and understand those pain points. But then I started, like some of my first positions in marketing was in product marketing. So then you parallel the bridge that you want to have between marketing and sales Well, then product marketing brings that other department into it. And it's that bridge between product and marketing. So I really feel like all of these different stepping stones from sales to then product marketing has really shifted into no matter what role in marketing, marketing has to be this nice, it's that pyramid. And it has to be that bridge between what product's creating to what sales needs to be able to deliver in market. And that nice communication bi-directional kind of congregator and aggregator to really make sure. And I think it's also the champion of just really a better company collaboration and communication. We're hearing things and seeing things in the marketplace. We're hearing things and seeing things that what product is developing or customer success is doing. And we are the place that gets to bring that all together and really think through thoughtfully how we go to market as a business. But I always will go very, very back to being a freshman in high school or a senior in high school and It all started with DECA. I will always give my love for marketing going back to Miss Atkinson, my teacher, my DECA teacher, and all of the wonderful things. Uh, She And she was actually my mother's DECA teacher too, fun fact, way back when. But she started and gave me that little seed for love of marketing, and it just grew from there. That's amazing. All right. I would love to now hear the story of, you know, Ovation's rebranding right? It was formerly known as Boomtown. And please walk us through, you know, the decision and the process of rebranding the company. 
Yeah. So the organization has been around, oh, formerly known as Boomtown since 2015. And it really started out in remote support and field activation support. So being able to be act as a call center on behalf of your business, whether it's your full call center customer technical support, or whether it's to work on your off hours or you supplement and work with your support teams. And then we have field activation where we have a team of reps across the United States that can go on site and help with your installations. And so we have a lot of wonderful customers in the ISO community and the payment processing community, as well as even Rectangle Health in the healthcare space where uh, we'll act on behalf But what we ended up doing is is as we were supporting our customers, we also realized that there are gaps in how to deliver great experiences and great support. So that is where visibility gaps, communication gaps, management of your cases, management of your customers. And so we purpose-built our own technology, our CXM platform, and really started gaining a lot of traction selling that in the space because we were using it ourselves to better support our customers in our remote support and our field activation support. And then we had the ability to, to sell that to other industries. And so what ended up happening is we decided about two years ago, it felt right with the momentum in the marketplace Uh, to rebrand our organization, to closely align with this CXM technology that we have purposely created that is is very, very unique in the space. We have not or we have not forgotten by any means, and we still offer up our remote and our field service to, uh, stuff with our CX services. We still have that. That's a, a very, very important part of our business. And our teams still use our technology. But now we've rebranded the CXM, Innovation CXM. And it was a purpose-built decision about two years ago based on the momentum and the shift and wanting to go now, go and pivot into SaaS technology and go sell our technology that we built. And I joined the organization during that decision-making of the rebrand. I joined the organization in May. We launched the rebrand and the new website and the new messaging and brand identity on that September, early September. So it was quite, quite a summer. And I was also hiring a team of marketers at the same time. So you're looking at rebranding while building your team. But I absolutely believe when it comes to marketing leadership that you hire people that are excellent at their job, they're experts, and you get out of their way. You help, you know, servantly work with them in the trenches, but also mm-hmm. trust in them that you've hired the right people and they're the right experts. And that was the only way. It's the people on this marketing team that really kind of helped get that rebrand done yeah. within three months. Amazing. All right. Now let's talk a bit more about the platform. I you know, would love to know how exactly it leverages AI to enhance the customer experience management. And can you share some specific examples around it? Yeah. So what actually makes our CXM platform unique is not just our journey orchestration capabilities. And there are organizations that have some sort of workflow or journey or journey capabilities where where we bring something very unique in is we absolutely believe that you have to connect your ecosystem partners to the journey. Um, And then we leverage our AI to be able to help through Gen AI support, but also data aggregation and data delivery. So I'll explain in banking, for instance, you have some pretty complex journeys. In merchant services, for instance, you have a variety of partners that you work with and depend upon. And so as a customer is going through an onboarding or an activation journey with your organization, they may in some parts have questions and they have to go talk to one of your partners that you rely on to help support that customer. The moment they leave you to go talk to that person, you lose all visibility and you lose all communication. You may reference a customer by ABC123, but your partner references the customer and their systems as QRSTUV. And so what happens from all of that is if you're needing to collaborate with your partners, you're not on the same page and you're definitely not on the same page in real time. And so we have connectors, not integrators, but we have bi-directional real-time connectors to your partner ecosystem. And that way, as you're orchestrating your journey and your customer is going through that journey, you're able to communicate in real time with your partners. And a single pane, like we have 
we have our platform. You do not have to go jump to another technology like a Slack or a Teams or an email to go talk to your partners. You're doing it while you're also tracking and managing your customer's journey. You can kick off internal communications internally to multiple departments. You can also kick off partner communications. But then even more importantly from that, we're taking all of your data and we're able to provide you through our AI summarizations. We'll help summarize the customer, summarize your cases. We'll also be able to utilize chat. So we utilize AI and chat to be able to expedite customer and, and seamlessly be able to help your organization and, and customer communications. So, but even more importantly, we're utilizing that AI to serve up better data okay. and better actions for you. And so there's a, it just seemed like the right next thing to do for us about a year and a half ago when we launched into adding AI into our technology stack within our CXM platform. And we've seen huge, huge savings, it's operational cost savings, even more importantly, time savings, the amount of time it's saving agents or relationship managers to be able to do mundane routine tasks that take a little, a long time. When you're asked to summarize a customer case, what happened with this customer? Why was it a bad experience? What would you do differently? Your AI can come in and provide those summarizations for you to be able to help save time. Right. Now, you emphasize a lot on the importance of, uh, you know, understanding your customers deeply. I would love to know what strategies do you use at, uh, you know, your current organization to gain these insights? I think the most important thing that you can do is actually get in front of the customer and ask the questions. So when we did our rebrand, the first thing that I did was interview our customers. Mm -hmm. The most important thing that you can do is understand Internally, here's who we think that we are. Here's what we think our value is. Here's what we think we bring to the table. Here's what we think from our product suite are the must have items, right? But does that actually align with the perception in the market? What do your customers or your prospects think are your most valuable assets? What would they deem are the most critical pieces to what makes your product suite most valuable? Sometimes they align, sometimes they don't align. And so I absolutely think it's critical for a marketing team to be able to absolutely not just understand industry trends and read the news and understand what's going on in the market, what your competitors are doing, what new technology is coming out there, but even more importantly, perception of what's going on in your sales cycle. What are the aha moments on a sales pitch on call one that they're salivating over? Also understanding their use cases because that actually helps you so much from a new go-to-market perspective. You thought your use cases were this library of different things within banking or healthcare or retail, but in reality, your customers are also identifying brand new use cases in ways that they want to internalize and use your software. And that kicks off better stories. That mm -hmm. kicks off better value proposition you know, tweaks. What you do in marketing is never stagnant and stale. It's always evergreen and it always changes. It should change. And, and it should also change based on what you're seeing in the marketplace and what your customers and prospects are experiencing with your business. Gotcha. And anything on your platform that you have basically placed so that you have that continuous loop of customer feedback coming through and, you know, you and the management can act on it? Yeah, I mean, I think we're, I mean, we have routine meetings set in place for discussion on it. We have, you know, a variety of meetings that where your marketing sits in and has the conversations. We have email chains back and forth. We have Slack back and forth. There's a variety of means to gather that information to be able to utilize. I've sit in on a variety of calls and, and also take those notes and share that back with the marketing team. Yeah. All right. And uh, now I would love to know how exactly do you incorporate storytelling into your marketing campaigns? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think, I think that you have to really understand customers are getting pitched so many different products all day long from their email, from their LinkedIn. There are so many people and so many organizations saying, we solve for workflows, we solve for AI, we solve for automation. At the end of the day, like how do how do you as a prospect you have to think about it? How do you even consume as you're a consumer and you go on your Instagram and you see all these ads? Like what makes you want to buy? 
at the end of the day, what makes a customer want to buy is understanding the value that you deliver. What are they going to get out of it? Not that, hey, this is a great hammer and it weighs seven pounds or four pounds and it's going to be really great for hanging pictures on the wall or putting nails on the wall. It's going to be a great hammer, right? They're wanting to really understand the value that it's going to deliver. You're going to be able to hang the picture that was passed down from generations with your grandmother's face on it. You know, they want to understand the story and how it really relates to a need and to a value and to a want to them. So don't just sell the product. Don't just sell the product by throwing a bunch of features down their throat. That's not going to get them because everybody else is doing the same thing. You have to really deliver the story that makes them emotionally say, hey, this is what I need and it's going to save me X amount of hours in a day. It's going to really help us elevate what we're doing here. It's going to drive revenue. It's going to provide efficiency. You have to really be able to speak to the variety of different use cases and when it's going to deliver to your customer base. So benefits and pain points should be the focus area. Yeah, it's. I go back to Simon Sinek and Simon Sinek's golden circle. It's always starting with the why. Why should you care? Not the how and the what. Like you'll get to that. And that is the thing that you have to always, I think, focus in on. And I will never forget in my early product marketing days, I worked for two different companies in the product marketing. My first product marketing company, they really wanted you to write more technical product marketing work. And then when I switched and I went to a different product marketing organization, I was told, mm, that's too technical. So you're you're batting left, but I need you to go bat right right now go into a little bit more storytelling. It's probably some of the best advice that I'd ever received that I will always remember is that in marketing, while you're connecting and what the product is building and what a product team is building and what they're delivering, you're going to get really stuck in feature mode. Okay, they're building out this technology. It's going to have this amount of parameters and these new features and these security elements. And here's what it's going to go do. That's excellent. I could write about it all day as to how it works. But nobody is going to go buy that anymore because the competitive market space has just gone into boom. The amount of fintechs out there, the amount of technology SaaS providers out there, the amount of chatbot companies out there now is through the roof, right? So we can't all just sell on those features. And so it was it was really important for me to hear that in my younger years as a marketer. And it's definitely something that we focus in on marketing now because it is storytelling. It's understanding the technicalities of what happens, but you have to deliver the story. You have to deliver the why. You have to deliver the value because nobody is going to buy just on a feature comparison. Yeah. Right. Now let's talk a bit about, Sherry, you know, the things that are really working well, the strategies that are really well, uh, working well for you when it comes to your own, you know, traffic or lead generation. What has been fruitful for you so far? Two years ago, what we found was we really had to focus on top of funnel and a lot of explanation in the marketplace of what CXM was and how it was different from CRM systems. There was not a lot of well-known, and that was a lot of the number one question we'd get. Well, we already have a CRM. Well, mm -hmm. CRM is actually different than CXM. And so we had to work a lot on myth busting, yeah. the difference between CXMs and CRMs why in some instances you may only need a CXM and why in other instances we work very well with your CRM and you're a complement to your CRM system. And it, a lot of times it depends on the factors of the, the business. Now, where we've gone and we were really trying hard to bring that awareness, the general awareness of why a CXM technology needed to be looked at, why you should consider journey orchestration, why journey is different than workflows. Why journeys is different than process builders. They're not all one and the same. Where we've gone now and what we've been very excited at is really in the last six months, what we've seen that we're finally ranking for are things that we built content for a year and a half ago. And I think it's a, a great reminder, marketing is a long game. And especially when you're rebuilding and rebranding your organization, you will see a dip. 
the moment you rebrand and you have a new domain, you'll see a little bit of a dip because people are thinking about you as the old organization and you've rebranded and redone your value proposition. And we we saw that dip. And then we had to go become to educate the marketplace on what we were and why you needed that technology and how it was different in the marketplace than what was already out there. Mm-hmm. But it it's not an overnight success. It's not within 30 days, all of a sudden, we're the trending product and we've got 20,000 people on our site and we're getting 100 leads a day. It doesn't work that way. Not in many, many instances. Yep. And so a year and a half later, we are now ranking for those things that we built in the early brand awareness days. And that for us is something that's really, really exciting because what it lets us know is that when we went to market, there were not a lot of offerings out there. Mm -hmm. And now where we're at a year and a half later is people are starting to really search for what is a CXM? How is CXM different than CRM? What is journey orchestration? How is that different? And those let us know that, you know, we had those right thoughts and slow and steady wins the race. And so we're really, really excited about that. All right. And apart from SEO, what are the other channels which kind of like, you know, you were leveraging for distribu- distributing your you know, informa- informative pieces altogether? Yeah. So a lot of our ICP has been within the LinkedIn community. So we focused a lot within dark social and really building out our content and our voice within the LinkedIn community, focusing on our existing page, focusing on our executives thought leadership out of their voice on their pages, also focusing on a variety of different communities within LinkedIn. I think they've really grown over the years. And so we focus a lot on that. And what we've actually seen is not just our branded search, and our organic SEO going through, but even the SEO coming from like our LinkedIn traffic has steadily grown year over year into our website. And so we have really kind of focused on our the voice there. We have a Twitter pres- presence, but our community is much more active within the LinkedIn space. All right. I would love to know, like, what are the main KPIs uh, that you keep an active track of to measure your content success? Yeah. So I think sometimes marketing has come over the years, analysis, paralysis by analysis. And I think we've become very, very inundated in so much data. But do you become so inundated? I think you have to remember there's a difference between qual- qualitative and quantitative, and you have to have a good mix of both. Our number one is revenue. You know, we we hold ourselves accountable in marketing to helping drive revenue. And we looked at it both sourced and influenced. Because, and not that we have one number higher than the other on that. We would like to see revenue grow in both channels of sourced and influenced. Um, We are looking at customer acquisition cost as well. And really looking at the channels in which that's delivering. From the website perspective, we are really interested in where we're putting a lot of eggs content-wise in the organic basket right Mm -hmm. now in lieu of large ad spends. And so we are really looking at what's that trended branded search over the time? What is the organic social growth? What is the organic SEO growth? You know, those are the numbers that we're looking at. You know, we do get hit just like everybody else with algorithm changes. We experienced one in March where, you know, Google changed its algorithms and we took some hits. But what I really look at impact down, you know, in the trenches of that is I still want to see no matter if we hit highs and lows in our traffic, like I want to see the branded and organic growth continue to trend over time where they don't experience the dips. That lets me know that those things are working. I might have overall traffic site down one month, but if my branded and organic, it's SEO and organic search never dipped and they steadily continued to tread up, I did my job. And that lets me know that the guys that we really want to attend our website are really finding us while we then on the back end are also figuring out, okay, well, why why did it dip this month? What's changed with the algorithms? How do we solve for that? And we also do definitely look from an attribution perspective of how people are finding us. So, I mean, we are breaking it down into, are they finding us from digital ads? Are they finding us from referrals? and word of mouth? Are they finding us from podcasts? Are they finding us from LinkedIn? Because that lets us also know where we need to continue or events, you know, what events we need to continue to go to and support. 
or what channels we need to go even harder in from uh, a content perspective. Gotcha. Right. Specific strategies which are like, you know, doing wonders for you when it comes to your customer retention side of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're very much in the land and expand mode of a business right now, too. So and from our expansion perspective, you know, we are we have monthly customer newsletters that we're putting out and we have webinars that we're putting out. So we are still trying, even once you've become the customer, we are still sending the information and education in our pro- in our customer newsletters. And the content that we deliver is vastly different than what our prospects may get or those that only sign up for our LinkedIn newsletters. And so we're delivering a variety of different content by audience. We want our customers to know the latest in even from a feature perspective, like a feature release, we want them to know that because if they're already leveraging us and they realize that they get more in-depth access and capabilities to a new feature release, we want them to engage back with our CSM team and to be able to take that. If they have the ability to beta test a new release and we'd rather them maybe beta test that first, you know, those are really great ways. So we regularly are communicating through newsletters and webinars with that customer base. And we've been really pleasantly surprised too with our software retention rate. And and we have seen growth over time of them taking more and more on in when it comes to their expansion talks and when they're ready to expand and renew. That's brilliant. Do you mind sharing the number of, you know, basically the number of your retention rate? I do not have that on top of me. It is near 100. I cannot confirm nor deny how close it is. But we have on our software side of the business, that is, we have been very, very, very excited about that. But do not quote me on that. I do not have that with me today. No problem. All right. Because you're passionate uh, about, you know, building collaborative performance driven teams. So what qualities do you look uh, for when you're building your marketing team? Yeah. So there's a couple different things. I really like to see growth individually. Like I, so I think that it is absolutely best when you are hiring a team to hire a, a, especially when you're building from scratch. Mm Mm-hmm experts that have done this, that have led teams within their respective departments or really become principals in their craft year over year. That's going to allow you to know that your first hires are going to be those experts that are going to come in and know how to grow their individual craft and go. You've got to move super, super fast. But even more importantly, I like to see unique differences, like unique differences in personalities in backgrounds and experiences, you name it, because I do not want a bunch of people that say copy and paste, say the same thing, have the same beliefs, have the same ideas, have the same values, you name it. I I celebrate differences because I do believe that when we get together as a group, when we're throwing spaghetti on the wall and we're trying to see what sticks and what we need to do differently, I absolutely appreciate the fact that we can come together as a group and say, yeah, love what you're saying here, but I don't know if that's going to work because here's how I've experienced it in the past. Or I read a new article and I think that this could be a great approach. Or what about this? Or what about that? I love too that we can all get together as a group and some of us have kids and some of us don't. And we can even just non-work wise laugh about it all. Or one has a dog that all of a sudden is like stealing shoes and bringing it to him in the middle of the office meeting. Like it's just, it's, I, I really, really enjoy I like. I think it should be a family. I think we spend a lot of hours at work. So why shouldn't we get along? Why shouldn't we be able to collaborate? But also, more importantly, still push each other creatively. I want to grow. I don't know everything. My content marketer wants to grow. She doesn't know everything. My graphic designer wants to grow. He doesn't know everything. I like to learn from each other. I like to know that they're they have a passion for what they're doing and years of expertise. Because then as we do scale our marketing team and we want to bring more people on staff down the road, and as we look to more you know, mid-level to entry-level people, we have the right people in place that are so passionate about what they do, so passionate about where we work, and so passionate about our team that we've built that we're going to be able to go in and rightfully so bring someone in that's more mid to entry-level and train them up and continue to grow people in their careers. Right. That's amazing. Now, Shay, I would love to know uh, how exactly do you keep yourself updated with the new marketing trends and any new 
you know initiative that you're planning in the new new future for your company yeah, I'll look, I'll be the first to admit, like I try to stay as in the know as possible, but I don't always do the great, the greatest job. Look, I had a meeting today with my content marketer and I said, you know what? I said, I feel like I need to carve out a little bit more time in my week to read a little bit more. I feel like I'm falling behind. There are moments in life where you're all caught up and you have all the time to read and and get up to speed and listen in. And then there are moments where life happens and I'm like, oh my gosh, what happened in the last two weeks? I'm, you know, I'm falling off. But I absolutely carve out time in my week dedicated to for I I can't tell you how many newsletters, probably way too many newsletters I've subscribed to. I love the idea of getting the newsletter. I am a fan of it because I can bite size chunk look at the variety of articles they're pitching and see which one I want to click on at that time. I love a podcast. I do not, unfortunately, with my kids' schedules lately, always get to listen to the podcast. I used to love listening to it while I was cooking until all of a sudden they're trying, you know, they're screaming in the background. So podcasts don't work for me right this second. However, I do love to be able to consume the information and I try to stay in the know as absolutely much as possible. But it's hard. I do feel like it's become in marketing guerrilla warfare. I do feel like things are changing all the time. When when I am looking for information, though, I do look for a variety of different things. I love looking at the larger brands and what they're doing and what their subject matter experts are putting out. I, I love that. I'm, but I'm not always one to one with where they are in their businesses. I don't have the marketing budget sometimes that they might have. So what? But I love it because it's the dream big, right? Okay, if I had budget, that's exactly what I would want to do. If I had budget, this this is an interesting concept. Let's go test it. But what I also really love doing is finding information and talking in marketing communities with organizations that are right sized like me. Because a startup scale up smaller marketing organization, you're in the trenches and it's not always pretty. And you don't have 25 marketers, 30 marketers on your team. You're a smaller team. But I also feel like that's a superpower because we get to learn and wear a variety of different capes. And it also stretches you to learn a variety of different aspects of marketing that in a larger organization you have individual seats for. And so it does push you to have to learn more and learn faster. But I do also love consuming information and sitting in on roundtables within the marketing community, right-sized where I can talk to another marketing leader who might have just gone through a budget cut or has only three other marketers on their team like me. And we can just sit down and go, what's working for you? Okay, Mm -hmm. what's all right, what's working for you? What about this? What about that? And so I get I absolutely think having that type of network and outlet with other marketers, leaders in the industry that are right sized for your business, it makes it very, very, it's nice because you feel like you're having a therapy session. (laughs) But even more importantly, I think you're always learning something a little bit more new. Okay, they've carved out intentional time to do this in SEO or that in product marketing. That's interesting. Maybe we should right size and try that for our team. So I really, I learn a lot that way. Gotcha. All right, Shay, we're coming to an end. And uh, now I would love to have a quick rapid fire with you. Are you ready for that? Sure. Okay. If you could use only one social media for the rest of your life, which would it be? Instagram. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) One day you wake up and uh, your marketing budget is tenfold now. Okay. Which channel would you choose to invest in? Advertising. Okay. What's the weirdest place you've ever come up with a brilliant idea? In my dreams. Sleeping in my bed. <laughs> it's I know it's not lovely. <laughs> All right. What's the most bizarre marketing tactic you have ever seen work? It was in a book, actually. And it was a basketball team that sent rubber chickens out. Mailed rubber chickens. It's in the book Marketing Outrageously. All right. Is it like a real life event? Real life. Real life. Interesting. All right. What habit holds you back the most? Overanalyzing. Okay. What subject do you find to be most fascinating? History. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Now coming to our very last question. What was the last Gen AI prompt or, you know, your last Google search? Choose any. Last Google search was learning all about the supplement NAD for Am- I'm looking at a supplement for Amazon Prime. It has nothing to do with work, but that was my last Google search. 
<laughs> thank you so much sir i really enjoyed this conversation and uh, thank you so much for taking the time out and sharing your expertise about the company about your past experiences truly appreciate it thank you so much thank you let me just say pause